at two years old, and my mother wanted to move on the other side of town, was this to drive, and that was still part of the county back then. In fact, this to drive was a dirt road when we moved there, and probably four houses at the most. You're talking before I-75, before the hospital. None of that existed. It was, it was just all real thick forest that surrounded that area. And of course, 25th Street was just had small businesses located there. And when my parents bought the house, they actually knew the couple that they bought the house from, Carolyn and Daniel Davis. And after uh, mom and dad signed the forms to buy the house, Carolyn jokingly told my mother, said, uh, well, I hope you know you just bought yourself a haunted house. What's up, you guys? Chet Guthrie, the Dream Poet here, coming to you all with another spooky haunt season video. And for the start of this vlog, you guys, we are here in what seems to be a regular, normal lecture hall here at Cleveland State Community College. Something very interesting happened here back in the spring of 1975 when two paranormal investigators gave a lecture here in this exact same room. Now, this group of paranormal investigators, at the time, they were not very well known. They were mostly well known up north. However, as the decades passed, more and more of their investigations would become known throughout the world. And it was a family who were at their wits end, who sat in these chairs watching as this couple gave a lecture on the supernatural now this family they had been living in absolute hell for about 10 years at this point it was a haunted house a very haunted location <sighs> the story that you all are about to hear is from melissa heiberger and her experiences at what is perhaps one of the most haunted neighborhoods in the United States of America, here in Bradley County. There was this married couple that came to Cleveland State. They were doing a seminar. And we're talking about 1974, 1975. And they were discussing the supernatural. And mom was able to talk my father into going, and me and mom and dad went over to Cleveland State to listen to this couple talk about the supernatural. That couple happened to be Ed and Lorraine Warren. We sat there, and they never asked for money, okay? It was a free seminar, or a free, how do you want to call it, lecture. Uh, you could leave a donation if you wanted to. If you didn't have any money, that was fine. That was our first real encounter with someone with knowledge of these things. And we met up with them after the lecture was over with. And especially my mom. I mean, she saw where they were parked and they were putting their stuff in the car and mama made a beeline to them and i went with her along with the dad and she asked if she could speak to them and they were very nicest oh my gosh i get so mad when people bad mouth the, the warrants they were the nicest most humble people that you would ever want to meet. It's just like sitting down with your grandparents, okay? 
they were just good people. And um, Lorraine was was more talkative than Ed because Lorraine was the one that really Ed didn't have a sensitive bone in his body. He he, he didn't feel anything. It was always the rain. He, he followed the rain fleet. And mother pointed to where our house would be, which was across the forest from Cleveland State at that time, and explained to Lorraine some of the things that were happening in the house. And mom even asked, you know, would y'all have enough time to just run over there? And I remember Lorraine looked at Mama and she said, oh, honey, she said, I don't have to go. She said, I can feel it right here where I'm standing. Yeah, Mom was like, what do you mean? And she said, Miss Heiberger, she said, this entire area is extremely bad. And she said, I, you know, Lorraine said, I could, can't even imagine what you're going through. And mom was like, well, is there anything that we can do? And of course, by then, Ed was asking about, you know, are you hearing three knocks or anything like that? And we were like, no, it's not like we see things and we do hear things but not like knocks and demons or anything like that. And um, anyway, they gave us their number and said that they would come back if we needed them to. But it, it kind of gave us, okay, Lorraine Warren is standing here and she's saying this whole area is evil. So that is how it began. How a small town in East Tennessee had ties with one of the most prolific paranormal investigators of this century, Ed and Lorraine Warren. The very family who the Conjuring series is based off of. The same family who have shown more cases than any other. Yes, Ed and Lorraine Warren have ties to Bradley County and it is because of Melissa Heiberger's family in this house. Now that we've already been here, let me show you this neighborhood. Let's do it. Here in the back end of what is now Vista Drive is the house. You see, before 25th Street was there, before the interstate was here, all of this was just one big dirt road. A big dirt road that went around and came back. Now something strange was going on as all these houses were being built. You see, Melissa's parents, they would begin to tell her parents that people were moving out of their homes some as many or some as early as not even two years into owning the property people would leave left and right all of them saying there is a strange paranormal force that is haunting their house what Melissa believed the reason why all this was happening is because on this land there are portals if y'all don't know what a portal is it is can be an opening to another dimension it can be oh, an opening to another realm kind of like in some cases like hell if you want to use that as an example that's actually one thing of what a Ouija board can do but before all this was here, you had the Cherokee Nation, and this was the last bit of their homeland. Now as the land of the Cherokee slowly dried up and slowly 
transitioned into colonial ownership. Speaking of that, there is a little black kitty. Talk about a bad omen. Yes, a black cat can mean a bad omen in some cultures. It can mean good luck. I'm hoping it's good luck. But as all this was happening back in the 1790s, about 50 years prior, there was a chief known as Chief Dragon Canoe. Now this chief, he was very well known amongst the Cherokee. He was probably one of the greatest tacticians in the entire Cherokee villages of the area. In fact, if Chief Dragon Canoe hadn't had died of dysentery later on, well, the landscape of East Tennessee and actually all of Tennessee would be very much different. There is actually one example of Chief Dragon Canoe and his men, his warriors, wiping out the entirety of Fort Nashmore. But as all this is going on, Chief Dragon Canoe, he says, this is cursed land. Now, some sources say the Cherokee did not put a curse on the land. Could this perhaps be what is haunting this area so bad? No one knows. And here it is, the very house that Melissa Hayberger and her family stayed in. And now we will transition to the parking lot, or I should say the driveway, for the next story. We used to call it a time warp. I know, I know that people have different terms for it now. But uh, we had a two-car garage that the door from the garage entered like a little breakfast nook. And you could be in the house and you would hear the car pull up in the, or in the garage. You would hear four doors slam. They would come through that door and come through the kitchen, go through the dining room, and go down the steps to the basement. And sounded like two women with maybe three or four kids. My mom had a, one of her friends over one day, and of course back then, people didn't tell neighbors, okay, I think my house is haunted because people would think you were crazy back then. So my mother had a very good friend of hers that had come over for, you know, coffee one day. They were sitting in the living room and here comes, you know, the sound of the car in the garage. And my friend's, my mother's friend, of course, had, had absolutely no knowledge of it. She was like, Liam, you've got company. And mama was like, no, it's, it's, it's not. And of course the door in the breakfast nook opened and you know, stepped shut. You could hear him in the kitchen. And my mom's friend was like, Leonard, you're not gonna sleep, you just came in your house. And mom was like, there's nobody there. And her friend got up, walked into the kitchen, could hear her walking by her, saw them, to, you know, heard the noise to the door to the basement. And then the voices, you know, went away. Oh. Tells mama she had to leave. Uh, it really scared her. And of course, to my mom, that was kind of a validation. Yes, Melissa and her family described this portal as being a time jump, almost as if it were residual and repeating itself. Now, that affected their friends so bad that they never came back to that house and now that was just the portals that ha or that were on the property you see the entities in question they were very much more dangerous than that on saturdays my mom would go and get her hair done and Saturday mornings was the one time I could sleep late because, you know, with the school and having chores and all that other kind of stuff, you never really got to sleep late. I woke up 
and I was in my bedroom. I had the far bedroom on the left at the end of the hallway, and it was daylight. I knew I was home alone, but I was in the process of sitting up. Okay, I was that wide awake, and I was getting up out of the bed, and then I was forced. It, 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 it was like a force pushed me back down on the bed, and I could not move. I, I mean, if I wanted to move my pinky, I could not have done that. The only thing that I could manipulate on my body was my eyes. I mean, I could, you know, through my peripheral vision. And we had shag carpet back then, and I heard a noise coming from the hallway, which, which was my bedroom door was to my right, where the head of the bed was. And I heard something coming down the hall. And I, I looked through my, you know, trained my eyes over towards the door. And there was a figure, maybe not quite two feet tall, I could, I could describe it to this day. It's, it, it's so seared into my memory. Um, it had on, I don't want to call it red, it was more of a burgundy type colored robe and neck down. It was uh, completely bald. It had large, not alien-like, just large dark eyes a uh, little indention where the nose would be and for the mouth it looked like it had had teeth and somebody had just flat out cold cocked it right in the mouth the teeth were kind of broken things okay just like somebody had just really busted this thing really good in the mouth and in his right hand, I guess, claw, it looked like a, a club, a wooden club, like what you would see on the Flintstones, almost. And I'm, in my head, I am thinking, this cannot be real. This cannot be real. And it jumped from the doorway through the air, landed on top of my chest. And I could feel the pressure when it landed on my chest. I, I, I'm looking straight up at this this creature, and I'm thinking in my head, dear God, what it you know what is this thing? I'm trying to move my arms to de, you know to defend myself, and it raised the club up over its head, and it swung. And I, I remember even trying to brace for impact because I, I thought, okay, he's going to hit me upside the head with this club and kill me. And right before the club would have hit me, he stopped and just started laughing, but there was no noise. I hear him laughing, but I could tell by his, his facial expressions that he was laughing. And he pulled the club back up over his shoulder and looked down at me and was just laughing. And then he jumped off and, and flew right back to the doorway. I felt the weight come up off my chest. And with my eyes, I saw him over in the doorway. And he looked over his shoulder back at me and then his face just went blank. And he stood there for a couple of seconds. And then I heard him run back down the hall. And yeah, I, I heard it. He was running through that shag carpet. And I, I, as soon as he got out of earshot, I could move. I never told my dad about that. I told my mom. And mom said, well, you know, you, you've just got to pray. Because, you know, we didn't, 
really did not know how to deal with this. This has perhaps been one of my most favorite stories to tell for haunt season just because of its ties between Bradley County and the Warrens. In this neighborhood, there is actually another story that I can tell on my end as well. In an entirely unrelated situation before I knew Melissa Heiberger and her family, it was in this house right here that my best friend of 13 years stayed in. And there were a lot of things that happened in this house that he, even to this day, he still will not talk about. Whatever it is, it lurks primarily in the basement in that garage. Now, I stayed the night with my friend Isaiah one particular night right after my mother and stepfather got married. And while I was there with him in the house, the door handle to the basement jiggled on its own. Now, I heard this and I am a witness to this. Now, Isaiah, he would even go on to say that whatever these entities were, they would even speak from beneath inside the vents. Often he would be using the bathroom and he could hear whatever these things were talking back to him. So what is it about this seemingly normal neighborhood? Why does it seem as if there are portals on the property? Could it be that at one point all this land was a sacred site to the Cherokee Nation or possibly the Native Americans that came before the Cherokee? We will never really know. But you guys, this has been a rather fun vlog to do. I'm glad I did it. Um, I know it's a bit, in a bit more of a residential neighborhood. But uh, anyway, remember, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon. Always means a lot. Goes to show that y'all care and that y'all want to see more awesome videos. So without further ado, you guys, vlog over.